A very good evening and welcome to another episode of South Africa Today and Beyond. This evening in uh, today's episode, I have uh, Shapna Mayat, who is part of the Women's Boat to Gaza organizing team, but I'm also joined by Leanne Naidu, who was also the delegation, uh, the delegate rather, a South African representative on the Women's Boat to Gaza. Welcome, Shapna. Thank you very much. Now, let's talk about freedom flotillas. And I mean, um, for some time now, we've seen and heard about freedom flotillas and the attempt to break the siege onto the Gaza Strip. Maybe explain to our audience and those who are watching at home what freedom flotillas really mean and what they signify in terms of international law, especially in the Israeli-Palestine conflict. Okay. Well, in 2005, um, Ariel Sharon said that he was disengaging from the Gaza Strip altogether. But disengagement actually means that even up until today, uh, Palestinians or the people of Gaza, um, you know, they are not in charge of their territorial waters, um, the airspace above them, or their borders. Rafa border, of course, being controlled by Egypt and um, Israel, and also the flow of goods in and out of Gaza being controlled by both Egypt and Israel. And and so the whole idea of a flotilla is to break the siege um, via the ocean. Right? or via the sea rather. And so um, basically, before 2008, 2009, there were single boat missions by the uh, Free Gaza Movement um, and other organizations basically trying to get into Gaza via the waters. Um, the most famous of the flotillas, of course, is the Mavi Mamara, which we know um, Israel attacked, uh, kidnapped the people aboard in the open seas, um, hijacked the boats, um, then took everyone to Ashdod, protest them, uh, on board, um, 10 of those activists who were Turkish out of the hundreds of activists aboard were killed. Um, so it was terrible. And um, really, the human rights violations were just huge. And as a result of that, different countries in Europe um, did cases which they brought to the courts there. There was a complaint to the ICC. And locally, um, the Muslim Lawyers Association assist, um, with Ziad Patel um, brought a case on behalf of Khadija Davids, who is the Cape Town journalist who was aboard the Mavi Mamara. And of course, last year we heard that South African courts would be enforcing the judgment by Turkish courts um, to arrest commandos who carried out those attacks on the Mavi Mamara. Now, we know in South Africa, the Palestine Solidarity Alliance is sort of been leading the campaign with the, around the Freedom Flotillas. But interestingly, this year, you know, the Freedom Flotilla was a woman's boat specifically. Now, tell us where the idea came from. Okay, so over the past about eight years, there have been various flotillas. You know, um, one was called the Tahrir because of Tahrir Square in Egypt. There's been the Shosha from Ireland, the Marianne last year, which came down from Sweden. And then the idea came about to have a woman's boat. And by woman's boat, we meant everyone aboard, um, the crew included as well as all the organizers being female, which is amazing, you know, just to find that kind of crew out there and a captain. And and so um, on Wom International Women's Day, which is the 8th of March this year, the Freedom Flotilla Coalition announced the women's boat. And um, of course, you've seen in the news what that led to. Now, let's talk about the, the response of the South African government when Leanne was, or sort of the boat itself was intercepted. And of course, Leanne being the South African representative on the boat, and we'll be sharing to her after the ad break. But let's talk about the, the attitude of the South African government, but in particular, the South African ambassador to Israel. I know at the welcoming um, press conference at Oratamba International Airport last week, Friday, there was a lot of unpleasantries that went down, especially from the ambassador himself. And subsequent to that, we've seen a statement coming from yourselves as the Women's Board to Gaza coordinating team in South Africa, calling from the recall uh, of the ambassador. Maybe take us through what happened at the airport and where the situation is now. Ah, okay. Well, at the airport, the ambassador came and he read out a statement which was supportive and thanking Leanne for her courage. But then he went on to add his own bit. And, and, and what he then did was uh, blamed basically the Palestinians for um, the 2014 attacks on Gaza, Operation Protective Edge. And um, he basically highlighted the um, kidnapping of three Israeli um, youth um, and their subsequent killing. And um, he, he didn't focus on the 2,000 Palestinians that were killed um, in that war and the 550 um, of those being children, right? And um, he basically tried to, again, make it appear like um, this equal war and he tried to make the Palestinians look like they were to blame for whatever was going on. And the problem with that is South Africa has a definite stance. We know with Leila Khalid being here at the opening of our parliament, South Africa's various stances, the BDS movement, as you know yourself, that South Africa is definitely pro-Palestinian. And of course, having lived an apartheid, this country is one of the forerunners in terms of fighting against apartheid in other places in the world. So for the ambassador to actually take a statement like that or make a personal statement like that, even though it wasn't, you know, um, statement of the country itself, is just absolutely out of line. 
Now, so where's the situation now in terms of, I mean, have you engaged DERCO? Have you, what sort of avenues are you pursuing in terms of trying to, that are caught? Um, so our legal team, um, Tisni Musa and Ziad Patel have um, spoken to DERCO. They've um, well sent out um, formal requests and explanations and asking for the recall, asking for remedies. Um, they've had no response. We have a petition that's happening online at the moment calling for his recall, which is at um, Owetu Mobi, and that's doing pretty well at the moment. There have been various open letters. Is, the public has really come out um, quite loudly um, against his statements and um, we hope to hear a statement soon um, from our foreign ministry. I'm sure the audience will also be following that particular bit. But I mean, as a lawyer, Shapna, maybe let's take us through, I mean, when a board is intercepted, just go back to the, 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 the board situation itself. When a board is intercepted by the Israeli Navy, and of course, I mean, let's talk about jurisdiction, international law aspects in the waters. What, 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 what do South African officials have to do? What do, and of course, I mean, Lien was not the only foreign national on the boat, you know, there are people from other countries as well. What ought to be the response of the respective countries when that happens? Is that not kidnapping? What is the legality of the interception? Well, of course, we know that Israel doesn't really care about international law, and they've proven that repeatedly. But when we look at the boat situation specifically, it was still in international waters. It had not hit the territorial um, waters mark yet. And to basically take the boat off route um, is hijacking and it is kidnapping because all those aboard had a specific destination they were not in israeli waters they were not a danger they were not uh, bringing contraband um, into the gaza strip what israel likes to say so in fact their mission was totally legal and the interception of that boat and the arrest of all these um, internationally renowned uh, female peace activists is absolutely in violation of international law so now let's talk about the, I mean, you talk about the territorial. So beyond the international waters, they then get into whose territory? Nautical miles. Well, it should be Gaza's waters, right? It's not Israel's waters. But of course, um, Israel being a law unto itself and an occupation, um, an occupation government um, has actually decided that, you know, these are their waters and they will control. And so it was interesting because previous flotillas have made it past the 100 nautical mile line and somewhere between the 100 nautical line mile and the 70 nautical mile line, they've been intercepted. And this time, the ladies made it all the way, you know, towards 40 nautical miles just before 40 nautical miles and that's amazing they were 65 kilometers away from Gaza that's the closest flotillas have been in a long time in fact um, as Leanne will tell you later the people of Gaza were actually waiting for them and there was a huge uh, welcoming reception planned and it was just absolutely unfortunate because at the end of the day these women were bringing a message of peace and their whole boat was about highlighting a um, woman's contribution to resistance and how women carry the resistance whether that's you know out in the open or people don't know about it the reality is is that when we look at a resistance when we look at these movements it is always women who ensure that these will these movements continue absolutely now will there be any sort of legal steps taken to maybe I mean the the, the issues that you're citing in terms of the involvement of the Israeli Navy in terms of the interception will there be any um, legal avenues pursued against the Israeli government well, our legal team is looking at that and of course we have legal teams in all the countries um, 12 10 to 12 countries where the women were from so different legal teams will obviously be looking at that and in the coming weeks we'll hear about how they plan to take it forward and of course the boat um, you know to ask for the boat back basically through legal avenues not ask but oh, so fight for the boat they back. have the boat still yes boats are always confiscated and so recently the Marianne which was the Swedish boat um, what the case was won and that boat needs to be returned and so I think that there is a chance that we will be um, going down the same road with this one Okay, so now where to from here in terms of the Freedom Flotilla Coalition, I think generally, and then maybe the next flotillas, what are some of the ideas that are coming up, if any, or are you just um, taking it easy for now? Well, there will be further um, flotillas, of course, because the flotilla, Freedom Flotilla Coalition has said that they will continue trying to break the siege via sea, and there's been amazing, amazing support from the people of Gaza it, itself. And so there will be flotillas coming. I don't think there will be women's flotillas. There may be, um, but we're definitely looking at flotillas in the future, so watch the space. I mean, you guys have done wonderful work, Shabnam, really, as the South African team as well, but I think internationally as well, you've served the international committee uh, in various committees within the broader women's board to Gaza committee. But um, if what people want to get involved um, in future uh, freedom flotillas, what do they need to do? Well, we have actually, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because we have an amazing South African women's team who has worked tirelessly, tirelessly for a year to get all of this to happen. And um, so our, we have a Facebook page. Um, 
Women's Boat to Gaza South Africa and our spokesperson is Zenit Adam. You can also get hold of us via the Palestine Solidarity Alliance, which is Johannesburg based. Um, so if you want to come around and volunteer, we've had amazing volunteers this year. We hope to see more of them in the future. Sure, David. Thank you so much, Abnam, for coming in to the show. And after the bad, bad break, we're joined by Leah Naidu, who will take us through her experience on the uh, women's boat to Gaza, but also talk about uh, the interception and take us through what happened on the boat when the Israeli Navy intercepted Zaytuna. Welcome back from the ad break. In studio now, I'm joined by Leah Naidu, who was the or who still is the South African representative on the Freedom Flotilla, the Women's Boat to Gaza. Welcome, Leah. Thank you so much. Hi. Um, let's start off. I mean, with your involvement in Palestine solidarity work, where 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 did you start off? So um, I was born in 1976. So I'm halfway. Uh, apartheid child and then a post-apartheid adult and so in my house uh, anti-apartheid activism was part of everyday life and because I had a coach actually and teacher uh, Ishmael Collier who was very committed to the Palestinian um, struggle I was exposed to this from when I was very small um, and obviously South Africans know that uh, there has been solidarity work that has, has happened I mean the first Nakba happened around about the same time apartheid became legalized in the 40s um, so for me, as a child, I always grew up knowing that there's this other injustice that's happening on the other side of the world and that we can't really separate that from the apartheid uh, South African condition. So for me, it's been a long-standing thing. This is the first time I've been able to really put my body towards something other than uh, pickets or we've screened um, documentaries and had discussions. All the usual forms of um, activism and protest I've, I've done over the last couple of years. But this to me felt like something much more symbolic, much more important uh, for m myself to contribute towards. Yeah. And let's talk about how you got to, s to be selected to participate in the Women's Boat to Gaza and become the official South African delegate on the boat. How did that come about? So there were a number of people who um, availed themselves. We had to fill in an application, really speak to what activism we do and why we think it's important and what contribution we think it could make. Um, and so it was, a, I think, an open process. I don't know who else um, applied, but I do know that in the end they, they did invite me. And I'm really, really grateful because I learned a lot, not only uh, being in an Israeli prison and in that whole unjust system, uh, but also being in solidarity with women from around the world who, are, who were willing to take two weeks out of their lives uh, to contribute to the flotilla, but many of them also doing a whole range of amazing things from the Malaysian doctor who could pick up her satellite phone from the boat and call an office in the Gaza Strip who work on medical um, issues. Um, so it was amazing to be on a boat for nine days, which in itself was a challenge. I mean, it wasn't uh, as people, as maybe naively I imagined, a flat, beautiful Mediterranean with sun and easy sailing. <laughs> there wasn't, so the solidarity uh, of women who hadn't sailed, some women over 70, most women over, I mean, I was one of the youngest people on oh, the wow. boat in very trying conditions to say, we're going to do this over nine days because it's really important that for us to sacrifice as well. So the solidarity on the boat was a huge learning experience. Being able to hear from women from around the world about the struggles in their countries, a lot not dissimilar from what we're struggling against. So it seems we're in a world moment where you have the rise of the conservative right, we have the Donald Trumps, we have all of this stuff happening, we have the constitutional coup in Brazil, and we have the continued occupation and colonization of Palestine. Now let's talk about the actual experience on the boat until yeah. the interception point by the Israeli Navy. Take us through that. So it took nine days. So if people can imagine, that's a long time. I'm, I don't know why I thought three, four days and we'll be there. I've just been on a ferry to Robben Island. That was not a pleasant experience. There was enough. <laughs> so the thing is that the first day, the first hour when we left, it was fantastic. The, the ambassador, the Palestinian ambassador to, to Italy came and said goodbye and had a meeting with us. Uh, the mayor was there. A whole range of students came, people who've been working uh, with migrants and refugees, everyone who is active came and said goodbye to us. On the, and the day that we sailed, it was flat. And we also realized once we were out and started to ask more questions about sailing, and about the ocean, about the Mediterranean, we realized that actually this is a place where many, many people lose their lives. 
um, not only be, not because of weather conditions necessarily, but because they are in desperate situations and they're trying to flee to other places, uh, often in in boats that are not um, well equipped with with staff who are not well equipped, well equipped, no life jackets, etc. That was not our situation. This was a wild para mission. The boat was an, an old one, so it wasn't uh, fancy. But the minute we left, was calm. We had a conversation. It was a beautiful leaving. And then about two hours in, we got out into the real sea uh -huh. and the water was choppy and people started throwing up. All of us were nauseous, even as we were putting patches and, and taking medication. So the first two, three days was really hectic in the sense that we were, we were understanding that we needed to get through the nausea, which is getting acclimatized to our new environment, which is this boat that's going like this all the time. Um, we also had two or three things that were really difficult for me personally and probably for other people where we had something in our rigging break and we had to have the de make the decision, do we go ahead with this broken thing and try and fix it at sea? Do we turn back? What does it mean for the mission? Who makes that decision? So we collectively had to go through a lot in the nine days uh, prior to getting there. We all did get our sea legs and then what we started doing was preparing for the possibility. So the Israeli occupation forces respond differently depending on the situation. We've heard already about the, the, um, the attack and killing of activists in 2010. We were a fairly high profile boat. We were also very clear that we were going peacefully. We were very clear that we were not taking humanitarian aid or money because previous flotillas who did take that, when they were intercepted, these, these things went to the soldiers as opposed to going to the people in occupied Gaza that really needed it. So we went with a message of solidarity and hope and peace. And we were really hopeful that no military in the world, nobody in the world would want to stop uh, anyone taking a message of peace and solidarity. But clearly the Israeli occupation forces didn't want us to get there. So now Leanne, quickly take us through the interception point when the Israeli Navy got onto and sort of captured and took, took over. And of course, up until the, the Israeli prison. So, so we were 100 miles out on the Wednesday morning at sunrise. 100 miles from Gaza meant 20 hours of sailing. So it's not like 100 kilometers you're going to get there in an hour. So it was still a whole day's worth of travel. And we were very nervous from this point because we understood that previous flotillas, this was the area where they would start to arrest you or to intercept you. We were counting down, we got to 50s, you know, then we got into under the 50s and we were like, okay, maybe there's some we'll compassion it, huh? and understanding on the other end and they're going to let us go. We also knew that people were gathering on the shores, that we'd been speaking to humanitarian organizations, women's organizations, educational organizations to say, come and meet us. We want to bring this message. We want to be in conversation with you. Then at about two, three o'clock in the afternoon, we see the first military ship. We see a ship on the horizon. The, ca the captain takes out the binoculars. It's clear that it is a military ship. Then we see another one on the other side. We see one behind. Now we have three huge military ships for our 15 meter long yacht with 13 women unarmed, not even with money or <laughs> supplies on board. The, then the, there's a longish conversation. I really don't know how long. It was a very stressful time because when you're in the middle of three warships and you, you know that the extreme... And the sense of surrounding. The surrounding, but also the, no, the, the notion that we've seen videos of how the Israeli occupation forces treated, treats people in, in occupied Palestine, how they've treated flotillas in the past. So it's a really nerve-wracking time. The captain is on the radio talking to the Navy who are now saying uh, we... We, we understand that you want to do this thing, but you are not allowed to do this because there is a, um, this would be illegal. And we're having this conversation through our captain with, with them saying, listen, we don't believe that this is a legal blockade. This is a humanitarian crisis. We are going with a message of solidarity. We are not going to be stopped. In a, we are unarmed. We are nonviolent, etc. So this goes on and on. And they try to convince us by saying, we'll bring fast boats. You can get on our boats. We'll take your boat to Ashdod. Let's go. We will usher you there. We'll be alongside you, we'll, they tried to get us to, to, to divert and they used all means possible in terms of verbal means. We weren't clear that we were not going to do that. They then said, well, we're going to have to by force stop you. And at that point, everyone really does have a whole range of images in their head because the, what force the Israeli occupation forces use is extreme. It can be, it, there's a continuum. So we're worried about what is this force. They then send these Zodiac boats, which are about the size of our boat, maybe a little bit smaller. They look like they belong in a kind of war movie where they've got guns and lasers and, and about 
15 people on soldiers on board two of them come out and we see them coming quickly on the horizon we decide to sit on deck all of us so that there's no one under deck we are open and saying yeah you can search us you can look we've got nothing that's dangerous um, nothing even humanitarian sure. they then pull up alongside us and eight soldiers get on board four women four men uh, they immediately start searching the boat as if there's something they don't trust what we've said. Uh, one of the young women is a sailor, starts uh, commandeering the boat, struggles a little bit because it's an old boat. We've been changing oil twice a day because it's a <laughs> leaking motor. So we're trying to explain to them, listen, if you're going to take us, let us at least help you because you don't. we don't want a disaster at sea. So that's happening. And then um, we're sitting in the sun. There's no shade on top of us for a couple of hours. It takes us seven hours with these soldiers to get to the port. So it's a long time that we spend with them. Um, they then bring water first for people and then they bring picnic baskets. And now they start saying, um, you have some food, this is for you. We don't want you to be hungry. And I, we had agreed to not say anything that only our team boat leader would talk to the leader of the, the soldiers because we didn't want to provoke them. They were really young. The average age is like 21. These are youngsters. Absolutely. I mean, it's devastating that a country would do that to, uh, to their young people, um, to send them, to force them into a military operation that is uh, holding down an occupation. That's a violent situation because you're literally suppressing a people and having to, to maintain that, which we know under apartheid was a difficult thing for, for, for the apartheid state to do and very um, disastrous for people on all ends, in particular the people being oppressed. So they, they, at that point, I decide I'm actually, I see one of the young sailors uh, picking up some food and I say, listen, I don't eat Israeli products. I support BDS, so I'm not about to start eating it here on this boat, at which point they ignore me and they, they, they have a camera person on the boat next door, uh, both video camera and uh, photographers, and they're taking pictures of the story that they want to tell. So before they get to our boat and before we saw the military ships, they cut all signal from the boat. So we had some satellite, we could send daily few emails that was completely cut before we saw the military ship. So there's this, this, there's this regime of military might, but there's also this regime of controlling communication. So every image that comes off that boat is going to come from the Israeli occupation forces. And so they're they going to tell the tell, story they want to. And this is powerful, right? So guns are powerful, but the story you tell is powerful as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. We're running out of time, Leanne, mm. but I really want you to do, take our viewers through your experience in the prison and what yeah. that really meant for you in closing. Okay, so in closing, um, I prepared myself for uh, soldiers and a system that was going to be brutal, that was going to be aggressive towards me. They clearly had a strategy to not do that. Now, we under, I understand that that's not how Palestinians and even Jewish people who are critical of their own government are treated. They treated much more worse than we were. We were high profile. There was a lot of pressure uh, on them to release us. But what was interesting was that even in the trying to behave kindly to us, that system is it's inhumane and it's problematic. Those are the things that sit with me more than the fact that we were kidnapped in international waters, processed like we were terrorists, strip searched more than one time, our bag searched like in the space of 36 hours, five times as if in a prison system, we're gonna somehow be able to put something in there. So there's this, this low level, I, I think I saw three doctors, a social worker, uh, they took fingerprints, we were had to appear in front of a judge. So that it was a barrage of supposedly well-meaning, look, this is your rights. We're looking after you. Here's a doctor. We're checking you. They check it's you. It's like a checkbox that they just try to... My goodness, a checkbox that wears you down, but that in their minds, this means that they treated us well. And actually, un fundamentally, the unfreedom of being kidnapped in an international waters, prevented on a peaceful mission, then processed like a criminal. They never let us have our phone call, which is international law. We asked for it consistently. My ambassador never pitched up for me. And even when my ambassador, uh, when other ambassadors came, the, Turkey, the Algerian delegate and the Malaysian delegate who don't have uh, diplomatic relations and myself who didn't have an ambassador there, were put in a holding cell while our, um, our, co our comrades were sitting outside talking to the ambassadors. We said, but why are you locking us up? They said, why are you locking these people up? And they would not. Yes. So we had to sit there. And in that moment, um, the Algerian delegate said to me, yes, clearly they treat us differently because they see we're Muslim and maybe because we're brown and we're not American or whatever. Mm -hmm. But this is 
in this moment, the three of us are really close to Palestinians and to Palestine because this is the, the way that people are treated. So, I mean, the, the, the entire experience of kidnap, uh, prison and then detention center at the airport, getting on a plane and having my passport withheld from me until I arrived in South Africa. All of this was to try and uh, uh, make us feel like this was something we weren't going to do again. But I would absolutely say to people, if they want to experience the oppression, even those South Africans who, were, who, were, uh, who grew up under apartheid and now in post-apartheid, we have no idea what's going on in Palestine. We really need to make these missions happen more, more often. I would be prepared to go again, but I would give up my place for someone else who wants to really go and see how bad things are there. It cannot be that in 2016, uh, uh, a state is oppressing a people in that way. Sure. Thank you so much, Lian, for sharing that information and your experience, I think. And also encouraging people to get involved in the Freedom Flotilla coalitions, but I think also generally the Palestine Solidarity Movement, Definitely. our experiences are so similar. Um, of course, I mean, there's a need for more activism continuously on this issue. Thank you so much for it's coming onto the show. Thank you so much for joining us on this evening's episode and have a good evening.